Hi guys. Uh, maybe I didn't pick the best weather for camping, but uh, at least I think it's not going to rain. So the topic of this video is satellite television and a particular era in uh, the reception of satellite television in Australia. And uh, right now in the bush, if you wanted television, you'd have uh, a satellite meter right here in a dish somewhere remote. For me there's the satellite meter but that'll be uh, set up later with a, a bigger monitor, 10 inch monitor on a, a thing I made. I'll also I guess explain why I haven't been on YouTube lately. Um, we'll get into that in a sec. But yeah your dish you'd have somewhere like this on a with a clear view to the sky which I don't have but it's good enough. Satellite meters or satellite finders aren't what they used to be thanks to specialized ICs which are total all-in-one DVBS2 solutions uh, which provide a set-top box, a television and specialized satellite finding software all in a simple small package. Vast set-top boxes are locked to vast content so if you've got one of those it's handy to have one of these satellite meters with a HDMI output to plug into a larger screen and have a look at what's out there on other satellites. So it's an ordinary satellite decoder. Uh, well it's actually VAST certified and VAST being the service in Australia, the main uh, free to air service for regional Australia. 10 inch monitor, there's a little amplifier hidden behind there. Uh, everything's basically bolted onto a box. Nice strain relief for power and some bracketing uh, for the cable there. But to elaborate on the free part, it is registered and it is uh, does have a conditional access system employed, um, presumably to make sure that uh, the right people see the right advertisements and licensing for material for particular states. So when you register, you tell the government what state you're in and you get a bouquet, uh, presumably, specific to your state. I'm quite new to the whole YouTube video story time format, but there is a story to tell, and uh, it's interesting that I can tell it now because at the time, going back nearly 20 years ago, I was only vaguely aware of the information that I can convey to you in this video. I'm going to put together some of the tools that were commonly used for uh, satellite television piracy. And in Australia, that uh, was Foxtel, which is still around, Ostar, which is gone now, and before I entered the scene, Galaxy, which uh, the, the latter two, I couldn't say that they're not around because of piracy or widespread piracy. You never know, but there are a lot of reasons why a pay TV company might go bust. Trying to encourage piracy of the smart card made by NDS's major rival in Australia, a company called Odetto. I suppose a pay TV company could just send the plain key to uh, decrypt its encrypted content to the customer. In a packet of course addressed to the customer's card but it wouldn't be long till someone else fished out that key and put it in a, an artificial packet addressed to their card and things did work that way for a while in uh, especially analog uh, cable systems for example. A very oversimplified explanation for the purposes of making a video, of course, is that your pay TV provider will send an encrypted key to your card, which contains a card key known to your provider, so therefore it can be predicted to decrypt the plain key, which in turn will decrypt your television. Hacking Odetto is so easy. All you need is, and he rattled off the details. Was it easy though? Comments like that tend to get under my skin because they're made from the perspective of someone who already has the advantage of someone else's tutorials, software and hardware designs rather than someone who's doing the work from scratch and taking an interest themselves. In terms of what was needed, it began with an original subscriber card that was provided to you and these were modified and eventually cloned so you could make two perfect copies and share subscriptions. But it looks like I've got a dud. It's an engineering sample and doesn't provide a, a usual answer to reset like a card of its type should. Uh, so I was going to demonstrate the process of killing and reanimating and in that process uh, erasing an original subscriber card but uh, I don't think I'm going to find another one in a hurry so I'm going to move straight on to 
pick wafers the stage where the original subscriber card was emulated for those who know what i'm talking about i did give this a whole night to try and reanimate it but first the phoenix interface which is the only interface you really need for an original smart card essentially a serial interface and i've made one especially for this video because my stuff's long gone uh, but essentially it'll transform one wire serial communication between the card and the cam usually uh, to a two wire communication to interface to a pc and also level shift between rs232 and ttl required by the card and that's your phoenix interface generally it's just a method to talk to the card the Phoenix interface got its name because aside from just sending scripts to cards to send it more channels or to send a new updated encrypted key, uh, it was also used to kill and reanimate cards. And this was done by glitching the power and reset lines. So I've added a 555 circuit to mine uh, to do the same. Pity I won't be able to demonstrate it. And I've also got a manual reset button uh, the software could control the reset line, so the manual one is just extra. And before all these electronic implementations, the solution was simply to wank the card. And this was called card wanking. The, the later devices were called electronic wankers, when you didn't have to physically insert and reinsert the card. Um, but yeah, no luck with this one. I've tried it a lot. But uh, that's where the Phoenix interface name comes from. When a card was killed, it simply appeared dead and broken, wouldn't respond to anything. And when reanimated through the same procedure, it would uh, reply with a proper answer to reset and all of its details would be zeroed, ready for rewriting. A secret unit within Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation promoted a wave of high-tech piracy in Australia. And on to PIC wafer cards. These are microchip PIC 16F84A chips with built-in 24LC16B EPROMs, which are 2K. Pretty cheap and easy to come by now, especially JCAR still stocked them at a heavily discounted price since uh, this system became obsolete. Similarly with their uh, programmer they were selling at the time. Prior to such a refined solution as a PIC wafer card, people also manufactured PIC PCB cards, which would fit in a card slot just the same uh, with a little chip hanging out. This one was actually manufactured for a particular decoder from a particular TV provider where the chip would hang out of a little thumb slot so it would fit in with the flap still closed. I might as well throw in this image of the 16F84A card that I took back in the day. I don't know how I got it so good back then. Um, uh, this was just the chip carefully peeled back from the plastic part of the wafer and in contrast this one is a genuine card. As far as any sort of PIC card goes the PIC has to be programmed before you can communicate with that software serially and most of that works done in the PIC programmer nowadays the PIC kit too. So the programmer for the PIC initially can be pretty simple and I did a, a pretty simple job of it. The card's EEPROM isn't directly connected to the card contacts, so any PIC program generally included a loader to program the EEPROM. It was a systematic campaign from within inside News Corporation to hack into the systems of its commercial rivals. I don't want to give away the key decrypt algorithm completely here because someone out there could still be sensitive about it even though it is obsolete, but I think there is some merit in having a vague understanding of it. I'll give a bit of time explaining a key rotation here which is similar to a bit shift or a shift in your favourite programming language and it's a shift right except the bit that falls off the rightmost uh, position is inserted back into the leftmost position and also we're dealing with an entire array rather than just a single variable. So if we take the spacing out of this uh, key uh, and put all the bytes together in a single stream of bits and we take the rightmost bit and shove it in the left, you can see that uh, each step uh, gives us a, a pattern where we can easily see uh, that the bits are being shifted right. This example being a 10 byte card key having 80 bits, if we bit shifted this key 80 times, we'd end up with the same 10 bytes again. 
Beginning with the 10-byte card key and the 8-byte encrypted key, both expressed as hexadecimal bytes, the card key bytes are indexed sequentially throughout every step of the algorithm, but the encrypted key bytes aren't always. For the first step, rotate the card key, take the first byte of each key and XOR them. Because the currently indexed card key byte is now even, the result of the XOR is used to retrieve a value from the second of two lookup tables of random byte values. The retrieved table value is then XORed with the encrypted key byte that will be indexed next. At the beginning step of the algorithm, this is the second encrypted key byte. And so it goes. The encrypted key has been transformed into a plain key. This was all part of a corporate strategy to financially cripple the competition, making them right for takeover at reduced prices. In practice, a newly created card might be without plain keys, so it would have to be issued an encrypted master key so that it can decrypt its own plain master key. So let's uh, have a look at that process in a program called FM Card. This still shot is just a better view of what the answer to reset should look like because we missed out on that with the dud original card. Were it working, I'd have used it for this segment, uh, but uh, I'm using an emulator instead. Um, so I'm going to open a script to extract a plain key just to make sure that uh, we can show you that it's all zeros to begin with. An original card wouldn't support uh, the direct extraction of a plain key, but an emulator has these uh, commands to read directly from EEPROM uh, to make some things easier. And uh, this is a sub-program in FM Card called FM Calc, which can also decrypt keys and produce uh, a card, which is a, a script, CRD file, that can send uh, the, the encrypted key we want uh, which will result in the plain key we want. And we can see that that's all twos, the same as in the previous uh, decrypt demo segment. And having sent that to the card, uh, everything's okay. It'll reset and read uh, the, the common details again. And uh, lastly, I'll extract the plain key again so we can see that that has changed uh, to the, the plain key that we want, which we should be able to read on the screen about now. The card's reply will contain 16 EEPROM bytes, but the key that we can see is there, B7C393B2DBAOF6E7, which could be checked against the previous segment. NDS declined to be interviewed, but in a statement they told us that they never authorized or condoned the posting of any code belonging to any competitor on any website. Just a bit of a distraction, I've got some unfinished business with Roman Black's um, pick sound algorithm uh, that I was playing around with back in the day and I always had an idea to, to get it working on a, a wafer card. Um, here's a, a Mother's Day card I actually made for my mother back in, in the day as well, um, which was a talking greeting card. And this will require a bit of actual software debugging, so I've gone and made a proper uh, pick programmer for the cards and uh, neatened up the first go. So I had to buy some new card slots, which are seriously marked down at JCAR as well. I might actually keep this one, it turned out so nice. Uh, and the card slots are really high quality as well, they've got a real tactile locking sort of a mechanism in them. Um, speaking of back in the day, uh, here's my pick programmer with built-in Phoenix interface. And back in the day, uh, a really handsome man made this uh, mobile uh, card maintainer. Uh, this little demo will show an EMK, encrypted master key, being encrypted. After encrypting the plain key that you want, this device would go ahead and send that in a command to the card in its slot directly. The earliest stage of the PIC sound player hardware, it should be a little simpler than this, but because I'm limited to 16F84A, which has no internal clock, I've got to drive it externally. I do have an Emerald card on the way, which is 16F628 and 24LC64 EEPROM, so it does have an internal clock 
and heaps more EEPROM memory. So the gold card I'm going to start with only has 2k of EEPROM, so we can only get a real short sample out of it. And that's going to be uh, Space Invaders shot, which is really just the and that's like uh, a part of the when you blow one up. Um, so it's pretty poor quality sound and always has been. You can fix it up with filtering, but um, yeah, I haven't really bothered too much, but I have got a, an LM386 amplifier. Before the inserted news clips are telling the story that I'm thinking they are, they're in support of what I believe, and which is that the system in question, which I've never mentioned by name in this clip, uh, was professionally hacked. Um, it was a paid job by NDS in another country, uh, which had a flow on effect in Australia and other places around the world. By the time it became a thing in Australia, we could already get our information from Germany, for example, who had been doing it previously. Admittedly, I've grossly oversimplified a lot in this video, uh, like the fact that your playing key is really another master key which is used to further decrypt more keys for decrypting video. And I've largely ignored the existence of conditional access modules which can either be a separate uh, PCMCIA card or just built into a decoder embedded, which is becoming far more common now. Uh, a cam mainly filters out packets that aren't being issued to your card and initially interrogates your card to make sure it's genuine. One of them ran a hacker's website from a house in Cornwall. He says the site was bought and then controlled by NDS's operational security. In the very early 2000s there was a website called the House of Ill Compute. Sometimes in Australia it was mistaken for the home of internet communication because it was known as THOIC. Uh, Rumour has it, and the evidence suggests that it was paid for by NDS as a way to proliferate uh, the, uh, I won't say the name, but uh, the particular satellite <laughs> encryption hack uh, around the world. And uh, it was always denied by Lee Gibling on his actual site, but later on in news articles he came clean and then always admitted that this was going on and uh, emails would be sent from the site uh, back to NDS so they knew what was going on with every sort of hack. They were keeping up with uh, not only the one in question, the subject of this video, but others as well. Um, it blew up one day because the emails on his personal computer leaked and uh, word of this got back to the site as well as the actual CDs themselves so that moderators could go fishing uh, through the emails and I've actually got a HTML snapshot of the entire thread where it all blew up in the moderators lounge which pretty hard thing, a uh, fluky thing to, to have in my possession and uh, Lee Gibling, his very last post, he denied it in that very thread. Here's the thread in the moderators lounge which was also accessible to NDS where a bunch of people have found their own communications on a CD um, which has been passed on to NDS, so you can imagine the shock. And uh, Lee Gibling's last post still denies it. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed that one. It was a bit of a long one for me. Uh, about a week all up from start to finish in, the, in real time. Um, don't forget, if you like any of my videos, to check the description later on because uh, sometimes I add... Uh, additional unlisted videos with links in the description of the public relevant video and I mention it now because that's likely to happen to this one. Anyway, I'm off camping and then I'll have a shave. See you next time.